So we're going to get started, and I would like to welcome everyone to the Compassion Consortium Film Night. I am Reverend William, and I am joined tonight by Compassion Consortium co-founder co Victoria Moran, also my spouse, and our colleague Phil Dijon, who manages all of our technical aspects of our services and events. So a little bit about the Compassion Consortium. We are an interfaith, interspiritual, interspecies spiritual center. And you can find us at www.compassionconsortium.org. We have spiritual services on the fourth Sunday of each month. And tonight, we will be featuring a retrospective on the film Earthlings, which I think we all know was a groundbreaking film that changed the entire direction of the animal rights movement. The film was, was released in 2005. Tonight, our special guest is Sean Monson, writer, director, and producer of the film. Earthlings was narrated by Joaquin Phoenix and featured the music of Moby. What a lineup. So before we start the interview, just a few announcements regarding our future services and events for the Compassion Consortium. The next Compassion Consortium spiritual service will be held at 4 p.m. Eastern time on Sunday, August 28th. And our special guest will be Light, co-founder of Gentle World. Gentle World is an educational and spiritual organization whose core purpose is to help build a more peaceful society by educating the public about the reasons for being vegan, the benefits of vegan living, and how to go about making such a transition. It was the first truly vegan community in America. And then our September 25th service will cap off our first annual membership month with celebrity guest Ivana Lynch joining us from London. As a teen, Ivana captured hearts in her role as Luna Lovegood in the final four Harry Potter films. Who does not love Harry Potter films? <laughs> she is also an ardent animal rights activist, host of the Chick Peeps podcast, and author of the powerful autobiography, The Opposite of Butterfly Hunting. So now some information about the film Earthlings. Earthlings premiered in 2005 at the Artivist Film Festival, where it won Best Documentary Feature. It won Best Content Award at the Boston International Film Festival. And at the San Diego Film Festival, it won Best Documentary Film. The Humanitarian Award went to Phoenix for his work on the film. The documentary is based on the three sectors of life on Earth, nature, animals other than us, and humankind. And it doesn't take long to see that most of the problems faced by all three sectors can be traced back to the third one. So some of you may not have seen the film, so I would like to ask Phil now to play the trailer for you before the interview. So Phil, over to you. You got it, here we go. Three primary life forces exist on this planet. Nature Animals And humankind We are the Earthlings Thank you. 
So, Victoria, I think it's over to you and Sean. Wonderful. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm Victoria Moran. If uh, you don't know me, in addition uh, to being Reverend Williams' wife and a co-founder of the Compassion Consortium, I'm the author of books including Main Street Vegan and The Good Karma Diet, and I'm the director of Main Street Vegan Academy, training and certifying vegan lifestyle coaches and educators uh, for the past 10 years and ongoing. And for those who, who do know me and who do know us, I just want to thank you for the incredible outpouring of love and support that William and I have received from everybody since the very unexpected loss of our dog and I would say our son, Forbes, uh, just over a week ago. Today, I was over on the east side of Manhattan and saw a woman making bracelets on the street that could have a name on them. So I got, I hope you can see, for William and for me, this says WWFD, what would Forbes do? And he would always do what's loving and understanding and kind, because that seems to be the nature of uh, of the other beings on this planet. They'll take care of business when that needs to happen, but basically they're not out to do anybody any harm. And I wish that I could always uh, say the same for members of our species. So it's such a thrill to have Sean Monson with us tonight. A lot of people contribute to the world and a few people change the world. And he, he is one of those. Before the pandemic, I was on the road a lot speaking. And whenever I was with a pretty much fully vegan audience, I would always do a little survey. What made you vegan? What made you change? And although certainly a lot of people had very individual quirky reasons for doing it, there were these great chunks of people who fell into a similar category. So the top four were in, in fourth place, was John Robbins' Diet for a New America. So people who were a little older, people who had gone vegan in the 90s, very often cited that. And then came Skinny Bitch, the book that did not sound like it was gonna have anything to do with animal rights, but it really did. And then Forks Over Knives, which came at dietary change from um, the health angle, but which led so many people to embrace animal rights and environmentalism as well. But far and away, the number one motivator for all these vegans was earthlings. Some people would say, I watched earthlings and I was vegan in that moment. Or I watched half of earthlings and I was vegan in that moment. So as we look at the past 17 years, the time that has elapsed between the premiere of that groundbreaking film and now, there's nobody better than Sean Monson to give us his view of where we are, what's happened, what have we done right, what do we need to work harder on. So welcome from Los Angeles, Sean, what a pleasure to have you. Oh, thank you, Victoria, happy to be here. Um, oh, well, and you're so busy. <laughs> Bless your heart. Thank yeah. you so much for, for taking the time. So please start with a little background. What, what brought you to filmmaking? What brought you to Earthlings? And what brought you to animal rights? 
Well, it's interesting just watching that little clip at the beginning because um, that was originally done as a teaser. Uh, I was still working on the film. It wasn't, I, I, it wasn't really funded. I was doing it myself. And so it was a very crude little uh, teaser I put together. Um, it's in standard definition because this was started in 1999. And, um, and I, I just had this idea of human uh, nature, animals and humankind and and um, as I look at it now, just to comment on that, to, before I answer your question, I, I probably uh, portrayed humanity as a bit too grim in that piece. Um, we are beautiful as well. We're beautiful, extraordinary beings. Um, um, we have this incredible, incredible, remarkable power. Uh, and maybe I picked up on that as a, as a documentarian. It's, um, I mean, anybody can see it, but... Um, um, you hold a micro, uh, a magnifying glass up to, to, to issues and, and um, it's extraordinary just the, the range of human, uh, of humanity. Uh, it's, it's, you know, the classic example is Hitler and Gandhi who are contemporaries. And if that's not two ends of a spectrum, I don't, I, I, I don't know what else. So anyway, I, I digress from your question, but I, I, I saw footage originally and that's, probably why I, I used footage as a tool as opposed to maybe a book or music or starting an organization. I'd seen footage and so I started to assemble footage and thought it might be one more tool that could be uh, helpful in people realizing what was going on. So we talked about how many people earthlings changed. What changed you? Um, I remember um, in the late nineties, I was doing a public service announcement on uh, here in Los Angeles on spaying and neutering uh, pets. I'd been vegetarian for years. I hadn't, I wasn't yet vegan. I was in my twenties. And, um, and um, when I was down, I went to, I, I filmed in downtown Los Angeles and I filmed in Long Beach. These were the two areas where the animal control officers, ACOs, animal control officers, um, allowed me to go on a ride along with them and see. And, um, uh, there was a lot of euthanasia, you know, there's a lot of euthanasia filming the dogs being euthanized. And I think it was one of the big moments, oddly, was um, uh, in downtown L.A. at the time, they would take the, the roadkill and um, uh, the euthanized animals and they put them in a refrigerated room. And that would be where they'd stay until Thursday, because I think on Thursdays, a rendering truck would come and pick up the animals and take them to a rendering plant. And there was something about seeing domestic animals dogs and cats in a refrigerator dogs and cats in a refrigerator that made me think of me and um so in answer to your question what started as a public service announcement about spaying and neutering gradually began to grow in my mind into beyond pets as it were into food and then it kept going into clothing it, it went into entertainment animals and entertainment went into medical research and and um, I remember vividly laying in bed in this little apartment I was renting in Burbank, California. And um, I remember vividly thinking, someone's got to like make a movie that just like puts all this together. Like somebody has to just go out there and totally just put the encyclopedia movie together. Someone really needs to go do this. And I remember thinking, oh, oh man, I think, it, I think it's me. I think I have to do this and I'm not qualified to do this. And that was the genesis of Earthlings. I love how unqualified people do such amazing things. <laughs> totally unqualified. Yeah. So you had not made any films before. You just jumped in with Earthlings? Earthlings was my first documentary. Um, I had done one other project, um, a narrative film, and I hadn't released it yet. It was an exercise I did. But Earthlings was, um, was the first one I, I embarked on. And it took so many years to assemble that... Um, because there were things I could film and then there were things I could not film. Um, for instance, it was easier to get activists in Spain to provide bullfighting footage than for me to go to Spain and try to capture it myself. So there was a bit of a collaboration. And so during that time, I was, uh, September 11th happened. Um, I started in 99. And so in 2001, and I was hired to do a piece for CNN about the rise of the Taliban. So I did that. And that also taught me some skills. Um, some skills in the sense of the non 
fiction medium and um uh which is odd because the nonfiction medium has is all about truth and yet we find that things that are super disturbing uh are too truthful and so it's very odd as a filmmaker to remove truth from the nonfiction genre it's an ethical dilemma but um if the audience won't come if the audience won't watch it then uh there's a balancing act there that happened on unity as well where there would be images i, I thought there are things i pretty much just you know i just said let's just put it all out there but on other ones i've and it goes on to this day victoria where i'm presenting projects and pitching projects and they're saying that's too much in fact i I might even go so far as to say that now more than ever, people are um, <laughs> very uncomfortable being feeling uncomfortable, and they uh, and they're offended if you make them uncomfortable. And so um, that's tricky for the nonfiction filmmaker. It's a little tricky. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk about graphic images because I think that within the animal rights movement, you'd be hard pressed to find anybody who didn't have tremendous respect for Earthlings and for Unity. But you'll find a lot of us who have not sat through both of them. Mm. And so what does that say about us? Or are, are, are we just too squeamish? Are we too sensitive? Do we get a pass because we're already vegan? What do you do with that? That's an excellent question. It's a legitimate question because on the one hand, you could say, and I don't think I'd argue with this, that violent footage lowers one's level of consciousness can have a damaging effect on a person um if we calibrate or vibrate at certain levels of awareness what i call traumatic knowledge can essentially lower our vibration in some way so in one sense it can be quite um negative or people see it and one of their first reactions is anger naturally naturally um but in the same breath, uh, why close our eyes to it? You know, it's, it's the truth. And uh, I always say, we, you know, we must not refuse with our eyes what animals must endure with their bodies. Uh, I was a co-producer of Dominion, which was sort of an attempt to modernize Earthlings or things, again, as I said, as a standard definition movie. It was very crude and small budget. Dominion is in high def. It's predominantly based on animal welfare in Australia but it, uh, the industries are consistent, uh, you know, um, and uh, um, I watched the first five minutes of Chris Del Force. He was the director of that film, excellent director. And uh, let's see, I first started watching, they brought me on board that one in 2015, 2016, came out in 2018. And I remember feeling, the first thing I saw was pig footage. And I remember thinking, we've done nothing. We've failed. We've done nothing. There's my footage from 15 years ago. It's standard definition. Here's brand new high definition footage. Same problem. Same problem. And I felt, so at first I was, um, it brought me down. But we haven't done nothing. We've done, we've taken tremendous strides, as you know. And um, it's just when you look at factory farming that you begin to see that it's been the way it's been since uh, since Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle, you know, a hundred years ago. Um, this is the process. And um, uh, Dr. Ra, who I think might even be on this uh, listening today, he always has a beautiful metaphor for it that I've always liked. Um, <laughs> my dogs are saying hello in the background, <laughs> by the way. If you can um, he talks about the, the two great uh, drivers of climate change, and he describes them as the burning machine and the killing machine. The burning machine has to do with fossil fuels, and the killing machine is animal agriculture. And that humanity, as we evolve, particularly through the technological phase of our evolution, which we're in now, and we've been in for about 200 years, we must find another way to create energy and, to, and uh, create different um, food production systems than the burning machine and the killing machine because the burning and the killing machine is what we know, but we were smart enough to come up with these methods and we're smart enough to find more, you know, uh, better methods, more efficient methods, which, which we also are seeing people do with protein innovation, other food innovations. 
Um, anyway, forgive me. I swerve all over the road when I get chatting. So hopefully this <laughs> no, is interesting. You, no, you swerve just right. <laughs> so, uh, and we are going to be opening this up for questions via chat. So when you come up with a question, just send that to me. Um, and someone already has. And since you uh, mentioned Dominion, this is watchdominion.com, who is asking, is there a translation of the documentary in all languages, for example, Hindi or Chinese? Of Dominion or of Earthlings? Of Earthlings. Uh, yeah, Earthlings is available in Hindi. It's in, um, it's in almost 50 languages so far that we're tracking. And so it's, um, it should be available. If you search for it, you should be able to find it in uh, most languages. Yeah. Wonderful. So let's get down to the nitty gritty of what we announced that this would be. As somebody who's so involved in animal rights, both as a filmmaker and an activist, uh, give us a report card. How have we done this past mm. 17 years mm. and what have we accomplished? Let's stick with the positive stuff for this question. What have we done right? Well, let me just say this is a preamble to your, to your question. Uh, many years ago when the Prius first came out, it was quite revolutionary, this hybrid vehicle, right? And it sold like crazy. It was a big, big seller for Toyota. It still is to this day. That same year, if you remember far enough back, uh, uh, Hummer, the Hummer re-released their car. And so that year, the Hummer and the Prius were released. And guess what? True to human fashion, both were number one sellers. Again, it's a microcosm of humanity, right? So um, uh, we have come a long way. Um, everybody's aware that some form of animal cruelty goes on um, in these facilities, perhaps more than ever. In fact, when I go to the grocery store and I see the way they market and sell meat, never before did I notice the level of, of marketing that is trying to say, okay, it's, it's grass fed, it's green, it's free, it's free range. I mean, they're, they're, to me, that's an indicator that they know people are aware that this kind of stuff isn't great. And so um, they're trying to get out in front of it. Uh, I would call that progress. Uh, the plant-based movement is up 300%, 600%. It's astonishing. I was in New York City before the pandemic. I'm, I'm, I'm friends with Ethan Brown, the CEO of uh, Beyond. I've known Beyond Media, known him for many years. And I asked, I said, when you guys go public, I'd like to be there to document it as someone outside of Beyond Me and outside of the NASDAQ. I'd like to be someone there as a documentarian. And I did. And he said, well, I, I, he said let me get permission from NASDAQ. And so, so Beyond gave me permission. I don't work for Beyond. And I'm this third party who wanted to come in and record this day. And then NASDAQ said, well, who is this person you're bringing here? Because um, there's all, all this security exchange stuff. And uh, 48 hours before they went public, uh, NASDAQ gave me permission to be there. So I flew to New York by myself. I brought my cameras, a little light kit. I rented a room walking distance from NASDAQ. And the morning of, I went over there. And, and, and in that morning, uh, there was a brunch. before. There was a breakfast, I should say, before uh, they rang the bell before they launched. And the president of NASDAQ, I filmed all this, said to this group of us that were there, he said, you know, um, I like to think, I pride myself that I have a nose for new companies that are coming out and, and what they may have to offer. And I have to stand here and say that um, I honestly did not think that this plant-based burger would be successful. And I just want to stand before you all as the president of NASDAQ and tell you I was wrong. I was wrong. And on that day, as you may remember, they launched it, I think, $17 or $18 a share. And before they closed, they were $70 a share. That hadn't happened since the 90s. Um, that's extremely encouraging, you know, for us that it's getting okay and people are trying it. So so there's a positive one for you. Wonderful. So the world isn't vegan. It no. isn't nearly vegan. Mm -hmm. So what can we do better? Well, this is all I think about. This is all I think about at night and in the wee hours and twilight hours. I just think like, in, at least in terms of messaging through media, which is what I do, like what would reach more people? What would be more effective? What would really change the social norm? Earthlings didn't do it. Dominion didn't do it. What the hell didn't do it in terms of, like you said, there's people out there drinking milk and eating meat in this day. We haven't changed it. Um, 
I read an interesting statistic this year about films, about uh, the most popular, top 10 most popular film genres. Most watched in terms of viewership, ticket sales, streaming numbers. 10 genres and uh, documentaries were a woeful number nine out of 10. And I began talking to some of the guys that I go to to raise money, uh, to do projects and to talk about projects and get behind them. And I said, is it possible that, um, is it possible that we are doing a disservice to the animals and to humanity and the animal and, and the environment by only doing, only messaging through this genre? Is it possible we're losing 90% of our audience because we don't do narratives if you look at other social justice movements, anti-racism or misogyny or different issues, you'll see it in television shows and films more and more and more. Environment too, environment too. What you're not seeing yet is environment connected to speciesism. We're not yet seeing climate change and speciesism as a correlation. Uh, I have this great spot I want to do where, uh, so picture this. Here's a pitch for everybody listening. This is how we pitch stuff. So you're looking at two giant kitchen sinks side by side, some industrial kitchen somewhere. And the water is on full blast on the one on the left and the water is on full blast on the one on the right. And a sign above the one on the left says fossil fuels and a sign above the one on the right says animal agriculture. And both are on full blast and just pouring over right into the room, just flooding. Uh, option number one, how do we handle this problem? Well, what we've done in the past is we just sort of close the door. <laughs> we just close the door and let the sinks just continue spilling over. Option number two, uh, we're beginning to consider turning down the fossil fuel tap. But for the most part, we'll keep it running full and we'll just keep trying to mop up the floor. So it's the classic adage that you've all heard. Do you want to turn off the fossil fuel? Should we just keep mopping up the floor? Uh, the environmental movement is reluctant to look at animal agriculture equally as a driver for climate change. We've been hesitant. So what can we do more is we can, somehow we have to find a way to reach people. And maybe it's a way we've never tried before. I mean, Top Gun's a great example. Let's take a movie like Top Gun. Top Gun, including the original from 30 some odd years ago, probably got more recruits to the Navy who wanted to be pilots than any PSA the Navy ever did or, or brochure. They handed out a recruitment office. Um, during uh, the pandemic a year or two ago, there was a hit show on Netflix called The Queen's Gambit. It was about chess. And for those of you who saw it, if you wanted to get a chess board, they were sold out everywhere. I don't think The Queen's Gambit producer said, let's create a show about selling so we can sell more chess boards. Um, and then back in the 70s, maybe, for those of you who were around then, when Bruce Lee was big, you'd come out of those movies and you wanted to go sign up for Kung Fu and, and fight everybody. But none of those movies were saying, here's the number. 1-800-KUNG-FU. So there was something to be said <laughs> for a different kind of narrative approach that appealed to people in a different way. And um, Victoria, this has been my focus since Unity for many years. I, I think we're short on time. I hope the science is wrong. I actually hope it's inaccurate, but I'm, it's not inaccurate because it's numerical. It's basically numerical. Um, they began measuring parts per million in the atmosphere in, I think, 1958. So they've had the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, 2000, 2010, and now up to 20. So, you know, like 70 years, and they just see the numbers keep going up. It's numerical. So they can tell this is where we're headed. Um, we don't have time for a movie to go down in history. Um, we don't have time to cajole people into watching films. I'm just talking about films. I think we need to do everything in our power to reach people on a completely different level in a Top Gun sort of way or in a Queen's Gambit sort of way. We have to Trojan horse it, as it were, or, or hijack our way in for the betterment of themselves, the animals, each other, the planet, um, and that inspires them. And um, there is a formula there that I think minds uh, smarter than me should uh, ruminate on and find a way uh, uh, to help, you know, spark deeper interest in people. Maybe that's what we're doing. I don't know if it's what we're doing wrong, but I certainly think we should look at that. Maybe in our books too, and maybe in our activism on the streets, maybe in all these different ways, that's what we should do. Just, to, just my two cents. It's fascinating and interesting that you're talking about narrative films because uh, uh, Reverend William has a wonderful screenplay that 
we've been kind of sitting on for a while and it's kind of uh, become revitalized very recently. So who knows, maybe we'll be one of them and maybe with that wonderful way that the collective unconscious works, maybe mm. there'll be uh, uh, quite a few coming at once. So I just want to address a couple of these questions. Um, so Debbie wants to know what kind of impact could a Hollywood blockbuster make? And she's saying, I've always thought that undercover investigators are real life superheroes. And then she's saying, and didn't Joaquin Phoenix buy the rights to a book about the ALF? Yeah, uh, that might work. Um, um, knowing Joaquin, he'll, he'll keep pushing that, developing that. So it gets, um, hopefully gets made and gets distributed. Um, it's an excellent question. Uh, again, I think we could look at other social justice movements and see how, see how they have addressed issues of oppression. The animal one is tricky. It's a bit like climate. Climate's tricky because, you know, it's human nature to find the path of least resistance, right? So who's to blame exactly? The problem isn't quite here yet. It's started to manifest itself. It's kind of around, but it's not yet at the point where we're all drowning or we're all starving or we're all moving to closer to the poles. So it's kind of a future problem. So it's not our problem. It's not a future problem. It's kind of no one's problem. So that's really interesting. Um, I love the Native American philosophy of seven generations into the future, caring about seven generations. There's something about us, us, the royal us, and I say this with the deepest respect for humanity, but there's something about us where I believe if you asked a person in general, took a poll, if you had to give up something now for something that was absolutely essential 30 years from now, absolutely vital 30 years from now, would you do it? I have a feeling we'd struggle with that because short-termism is, is, has become so in, inherent in us that uh, we just don't worry that far ahead. And I'm not sure how to sort of reset that a little bit so we do take an interest. I, I just did two PSAs, by the way, because I do stuff in between films all the time. And I did one. I, I don't know if they've been released. Uh, um, I did them with... Um, uh, the plant-based treaty group. And I don't know if they've released them, but I, I found footage, C-SPAN footage of Carl Sagan um, from 1985. And uh, Carl Sagan was talking to a Senate panel about this thing called the greenhouse effect. And uh, this is 1985. And there he is some 37 or whatever years ago it was. And he's explaining to these senators that this is real, that it is measurable. And a very young Al Gore is is there is there listening and then Al Gore speaks and and the senators are these older men they're sort of scratching their heads going well when well, when is this supposed to happen and he describes a lot of the things we see today hurricanes floods fires droughts uh, things happening simultaneously that seem like opposites and uh, actually it was Gore who said we believe that we'll start seeing this early in the 21st century which is exactly what's happened the scientists have been pretty spot on with that one I found that to be quite chilling looking back at some C-SPAN footage from 37 years ago, and they're talking about what we're seeing today. There must be a way, there must be a way to reach people for their own good um, <laughs> in a Queen's Gambit sort of way that makes them want to run out and buy the eco compassionate version of a chessboard that would be good for them. Um, so everybody that's up on that's on all of us in a way to just at least kind of workshop that idea, bulwark that idea and just really contemplate it. Um, I know we're doing our best with the resources we have. I see activists on the street with bullhorns yelling at people and I know they're just they're just trying. That's what they know. It's what they have. It's what they can do. Um, even if you buy a car, you'll get a survey that day or the next day, because it's the big corporation's way of saying, are we being effective? Is this working? Because then they'll look at that and say, let's modify, let's modify, let's change. Uh, does the movement do surveys on itself and modify? Um, I don't know, but I would encourage each of us to consider looking at what we can do and being open to modifying and finding a better, quicker way to reach as many people as we can. 
So, so what can we do? I think that a lot of us spend a lot of time feeling frustrated. I'm doing the best I can. And it doesn't seem like it's doing enough. So should we be out with the bullhorn? You know, what, what works? We can't all start a Beyond Burger company. Right, right. So what else can we do? Well, remember, each of you, everybody here listening, has a unique voice that is uh, solely their own. Uh, and has an, a, a unique perspective and a viewpoint that is no one else's. Um, if I was to look at any name on here, if I was to pick someone like Marion or Catherine or Jeff or Dave, you know, or Linda, just just names I'm just glancing at. Um, there are voices that only uh, you have to offer. And one of the beautiful things about um, you know this technology we have is um, that people do read comments, and and uh, that never existed before right before uh this sort of modern era you know we had freedom of religion we had a freedom of speech but we never had freedom of the press individually the way we have um since this social media age um so um there's certainly that that you can do and of course in terms of your diet i mean what the beautiful thing about the diet consider this for a moment there's there's no one you have to elect there's no corporation you have to build. There's no laws you have to enact. No armies have to be assembled. It all starts and stops with the taste buds. It all starts and stops with the mouth right here. And it's something you can do every single day, maybe three times a day. Some of us eat six times a day. Some of us eat once. Um, it's truly something you can control. And that's what I love about these alternative companies because they're trying to say, all right, these guys aren't going to eat kale right away. That's too much of a jump for them. So uh, they want to have a burger and they want to have this. In fact, this, you know, the cell-based meat is really their, their version of getting as close to it as possible. Um, I just saw a product um, that was shown to me that was a, this is very interesting, that was a vegan way. Vegan yes, way. Yes, I just heard about that. Vegan way. And I just saw it and I said, okay, so, the, uh, and someone big in the movement, I won't say huge, huge person. You all know who this person is, the one who showed it to me. And I said, okay, well, this seems legitimate. Then it's coming from a legitimate source. Let's see, what's the deal? And it's growing from yeast. There is no dairy product in it at all, but somehow through the yeast, it creates essentially dairy. And um, I thought, why? My first question is Why? But the big selling point on the back of the package is it's 95% less water, 95% less this, 90% less that. So for those who are bent on continuing this way, but they maybe do care about the environment, look, they're providing an alternative. It's incredible. It's incredible. It's, a, it's an innovation. Yeah. And the great thing about market disruptions and innovations that we have to look at that are so wonderful. I mean, remember, I always say the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. Uh, you know, uh, bronze was a better way to make tools, right? So, so, um, and you know, back when uh, Henry Ford was in, inventing the, the Model T, you know what he kept asking everybody, you probably read it, right? He went out and he said, what do you want? What do you want? And they all universally kept saying the same thing. I want a faster horse. And, and uh, he said, well, I've got something for you. And it was called the horseless carriage. And if you look at that, you can look it up on Google, a photo of the Easter Day Parade. New York City, Fifth Avenue, I believe, 1900. It's black and white picture, and it's all horse and buggies, crowded with horse and buggies, 1900 Easter Day Parade in New York City. And at the caption at the bottom will say, can you find the car? And in there is one tiny car, one of the first automobiles. It's kind of way back on the side, but it's pretty much horse and buggy. 12 years later, 10, 12 years, that's about a good indicator for a disruption. Um, same thing, New York City, Fifth Avenue, Easter Day Parade. And the caption says, can you spot the horse? Because it's completely changed. It's all automobiles and there is one. And, uh, and that's what happens with these disruptions. And so um, we may see in the next 10 years, by 2030, certainly by 2035, that meat and dairy may even realize that this isn't feasible anymore. I mean, when Tyson comes out with the chicken, that's interesting. When Tyson comes out, or Pilgrims comes out with their own alternative chicken, plant-based chicken, um, they may even find it's more feasible to grow it this way. Begrudgingly, I can't speak for them. I don't know. But economically, I wish I could say we did it for health reasons. I wish I could say we did it for ethical reasons. I, I wish I could say we did it for the environment. But at the end of the day, we might save ourselves 
because it's economically beneficial to do it. But I'll take it any way we can get it. If it moves us a little further along, then I'll anyway, celebrate that as a step forward. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah, I heard about the way from my daughter, who's a professional aerialist. And mm -hmm. in that athlete community, there's mm -hmm. all this buzz about the vegan way because there's this idea that whey is somehow a superior yeah. protein. Yeah. So whatever it takes, as you yeah. say. So you use the term plant-based. So I'm going to go to another question here. Okay. IPCC in latest report, AR6, is asking people to go plant-based but not vegan. Why do you think that is and how can we change it? I don't know why the IPCC chose that terminology. Um, yeah, they might find it that it's a little easier on, on consumers because vegan, um, uh, vegan can be misunderstood by new people coming into it. It might seem aggressive or, uh, or violent. And so um, they may have met a few vegans that they weren't too, they didn't have a great experience with. Uh, so they say plant-based. Um, um, I've heard that a lot from the medical community that I know of certain physicians who are vegan, uh, but they tend to not use that term as much. I interviewed the chief of cardiology at Rush in uh, Chicago and um, um, vegan, but he tends to use the term plant-based when he goes around because these are all these are all heart patients these are all patients who've had a heart attack and he says it's a classic thing he goes around in the morning after he does rounds uh, in the hospital and these are all heart attack pa uh, patients and the, and the first thing to remember if you you all don't know this already is that your chances of surviving a heart attack are 50 percent one and two so that means half the people who have their first heart attack never received a warning possibly and they died they're dead they're no longer on the earth that's a pretty steep number the other half who survived are the lucky ones. And these are the ones that uh, this physician, this chief of cardiology at Rush uh, University um, would go around in the morning and say, uh, he'd go to the patient and say, well, do you know what happened? And it happened and they're sort of groggy and they've had their whole world turned upside down. And they'll be like, uh, I had a heart attack. And he's like, yeah, 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 I had a heart attack. And um, did they tell you what they found in there? And uh, he says, um, uh, uh, it was clogged up. It was clogged up. He says, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's pretty clogged up. We had to clean it out. Did they tell you what it was? And uh, they'd say, they told me it was clogged up with cholesterol and plaque. And he'd say, that's right. That's right. And then his big question that he'd ask, this wonderful plant-based uh, cardiologist, he'd say, let me ask you one last question. Do you know how it got there? And he says, every time, 100%, they'd say, I ate it. Now I asked him, I said, does it take us going to the brink, right to the brink, possibly dying, 50-50 chance of survival to wake up? Is that what it takes? And he says, I hope not. Mm. But sometimes that might be what it takes. Over here on the questions, I don't want to skip anybody, although uh, I may, someone is, is, Susanna is asking, are you saying way, W-H-E-Y? Yes. Correct, yes. Um, and Rita says, vegan seems more like a belief or a political position where plant-based is simply a food choice. There is less attached to plant-based. And then, um, mm -hmm. let's see. Oh, uh, Debbie is asking any tips on getting this information covered by mainstream media? Hmm. Uh, well, it, to answer the first part, yes, uh, vegan is more of a, uh, it's not a diet. It's uh, how you live your life. It's a completely bigger thing, uh, but it might be line up online for people. So we start with the diet. If that's where they start, they can get into their belts and shoes. And if their products are tested on animals later, you know, start where they start and grow, hopefully. Um, as for mainstream media, remember this, this is tricky and it's a bit discouraging, but most mainstream media has uh, major advertisers and most major advertisers in the dairy and pharmaceutical industry. So it can be tricky, it can be tricky to get that stuff out there. Uh, Dr. Jeff Feynman is asking, what is the eco-compassionate chessboard that people could go out and buy now? Okay, Dr. Jeff, that is a $2 million question. And I'm hoping you can answer it because I'd like to know too. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Um, and maybe that's each one of our versions of it. Victoria, what you do, you know, what you bring to the world, uh, Reverend William, what you bring to the world, uh, and Dr. Jeff, what you bring to the world, each of us, that might be our chessboard with the people we intersect with, with the people we intersect with, because we could all step back and say, well, maybe this gets a little bit into effective altruism, which I'll try to steer away from that um, because that's a beautiful thing too. But also if you find yourself saying, well, I'm intersecting at this moment with this person. Uh, What is the most effective way I can have a a positive effect on this person? Uh, As opposed to saying, well, I'm going to go, you know, instead I'm going to go home and get my cape and I'm going to fly around the city and I'm going to try to rescue everything I can. Uh, I like to think that hopefully, hopefully, hopefully we're, we're, um, um, well placed throughout the world, you know, evenly placed maybe where there's activists and communities here and there everywhere, and that they're intersecting with whomever they're encountering and having a positive effect. I am a believer, this is probably one of the more spiritual things you'll hear me say, but I'm a believer that everything is aware, Um, not just people, but certainly animals and certainly uh, nature. I believe everything is aware and is aware when you pass by. And so that's why um, I encourage vegans to be very sensitive and very careful and very compassionate when they interact with somebody. It may be your only time that you cross paths with this person in this lifetime. Make sure under every circumstance, no matter what, no matter how upset you are, that whatever your interaction is, it has a positive effect. Mm. Not a negative one. Not a negative one. Beautiful. Then everybody can have a what would Forbes do bracelet. So I want to ask you about your life. Because we're always interested in how other people live. I know that that you and, and Amy are just doing so much for animals. What does your life look like on a day to day basis? Um, well, we have a daughter. You know, she's going to be four in the fall. She's a handful, Phoenix. And um, uh, I also have an older daughter um, who's she just turned twenty one. She's going about to leave this weekend to go back to college. She's at the University of Utah, and um, so it's weird that I have it. A 21 year old kid um, doesn't seem possible. I'm not sure how that happened, but uh, um, and then I have this little one. So just as one was going off to college, I was back in diapers. Um, it's beautiful. Uh, my biggest concern is the future for them, the kind of world that they'll inherit. Um, you know, um, uh, but for the most part, every day is the same. You know, uh, we wake up, we we, we um, work, and. Uh, we, we try to maintain the instrument, maintain the instrument, you know, that you're given in this life, take good care of it, take good care of your body. My mother is 81 and my father is 81. My mother has never been really big on exercise. Neither are vegan, both are vegetarian. Um, my father has exercised his whole life, uh, played tennis his whole life. And uh, my father's running around at 81 playing tennis and my mother uses a walker. So there's a little bit of an indication of um the positives of of um of fitness and maintaining the instrument so we try to do that now too and um but mostly we spend our time uh reading what we can and studying what we can and finding the most effective way to reach people amy has a sanctuary um and uh they often call me because i have a truck i have an electric car too but i also have a truck and a trailer and i can't tell you how many times i've been called where i've had we've had to go pull animals uh, here or there and you need to have transport. You need to have a, a means to transport. Uh, I live uh, I live very close to Malibu. And in 2018, we had this terrible fire, late 2018, we had this horrible fire here in Malibu. And we were all on standby, evacuation standby. But I worked with another animal rights group in LA. And um, we had permission every night to go into the city of Malibu to pull animals out because people fled so quickly. And we had to have a police escort because there was so much... Um, so much looting going on again classic humanitarian and a terrible thing happens there's an opportunity to steal <laughs> so the police had to give us an escort going through and we had a list of homes we'd go to to rescue animals that were left behind in the fire and then we take them to the sanctuary so um so i think it's uh, i'd encourage anybody if uh, there's keyboard activism and there's uh, internet activism and social media activism but i encourage you to not always view the world from 30,000 feet if you can but also get your feet dirty and go down and ask uh, volunteers somewhere or smell the animals and get dirty with them because um the closeness of an individual animal is uh can be can be profound as i'm sure all of you 
No, in fact, I remember one quick, very short story when I was I was actually filming in a in a slaughterhouse outside L.A. And we'd been given permission by the owners. This is one of the few times I had permission to go inside with cameras. Usually we don't have permission. We're filming from the outside with drones or hidden cameras, but we had permission. And there were 14 USDA officers inside. Um, and so everything was, and it was, they, they, uh, the facility is kosher two days a week. It's clean so it can be kosher and meet the kosher criteria. And that day happened to be a kosher day. So there was a rabbi. And I was brought up to this uh, this area where they kill the cows and um, the rabbi was in front of me and the USDA inspector was standing right behind me. And I'll never forget the inspector said, can you see everything okay? And it was very surreal because for 20 years we've been sort of skulking around trying to get footage and here they had given us permission to come in. And here I was between the rabbi and I've never been so close in my life and I've seen you know, uh, quite a bit, but I'd never been that close. And this cow came in um, and we saw her from the side. That's how she was. And she puts her head through a hole and a clamp would, would push her, her jaw up to expose her throat. And um, the rabbi had this very long blade. It looked like, um, it wasn't so much a machete, but it almost looked like a sword. It looked like Excalibur. If anybody remembers the movie, like it looked like it looked like a mirror. It shined like a mirror. It was silver and reflecting and shining. It was so sharp. And what I remember about this beautiful cow, and this is in the supreme moment, right? This is the moment before the moment. Uh, it's absolute. It's absolute for this cow. I was looking at her and she's staring at this wall and she probably has some sense of what's about to happen, but maybe not quite totally sure. But she had the most beautiful eyelashes and I'll never forget looking. I couldn't take my eyes off her eyelashes. She had these beautiful long eyelashes and I'm looking at her from the side and she's blinking. And um, and then he he proceeded to, to cut her throat. And um, I went home that night and um, I have this walk-in this closet and um, I was changing my clothes and I I noticed I had some blood on my pants and on my boots I had spots of blood and I just sort of stood there in the closet for a minute thinking about this cow and her eyelashes and this beautiful moment and how her blood her, this, this sort of artifact is on me um, and I was so deeply touched by it more than any philosophy I've ever read or any writings I've read and so I I would humbly encourage all of you if you have a chance to go to a sanctuary or, or get close to an animal and see them up close and know that they're aware of you because it's quite a, a beautiful thing. Maybe, maybe our senses are becoming encrusted from disuse, you know, and we need to just practice that a little more. We come by it honestly. We're busy. You know, we live in cities and we're busy. So uh, anyway, Thank just a you. thought. Oh. I could listen to you for a very long time and I know everyone could. I want to apologize to anybody whose question I don't get to because we officially only have five more minutes. Maybe uh, we could impose upon this wonderful man to go for 10, but we're still not going to get to all the questions. Casey uh, wanted to ask about uh, films and books targeted at children to help burst the bubble of lies in which most children are born. You now have a child of your own. What about creating an animated film that Phoenix would enjoy? Ah, uh, it's great. I've been asked this before. I'm not quite sure how. I've thought a lot about it. Um, I have a project that I've been working on since before Earthlings. I've never talked about it, so it'll be a little bit of an exclusive, but I'll share it here. I have a project that's called The Great Silence, and um, it's based on a book, actually, from the 70s. It's out of print, and, uh, and it's one of the most beautiful stories I've ever read. Um, and the author who wrote it uh, said that the animals came to him in, in, in his dreams and they kept coming to him in his dreams and saying, you must tell our story. And he wrote this book. And, um, and uh, in the 90s, I read it um, and uh, contacted him and, and wrote the screenplay. And I remember saying, if I make only one film in my life, this is the four things, if I make only one film, I have to make this book into a film because I think it is an animated film. That's why I thought of it when you mentioned that. And um, or when that little question brought that up. And um, it has some of the most tender moments in it um, that, might, that might be that sort of chessboard way 
of reaching people because the author was so uh, profound and, and and there's a bit of satire to it. You know, uh, it makes you think of it differently. For instance, there's a scene in a, in an animal testing lab and there's a rat who just hasn't been killed. He just happens to have survived over and over again. And all the other ones are dying in this lab and he just hasn't been picked for death. And he slowly becomes insane and it becomes pro vivisection in the process. He's like, he becomes like sort of a Stockholm syndrome thing. He becomes like his oppressor. And so, uh, he's got this sort of quasi authorship of, of why he thinks he's um, he knows what man wants, but the way the writer structured it was brilliant because when the animals are getting ready to die for some test, this rat would say, don't you know that your deaths are going to help them uh, build better parking lots? Uh, don't you understand that your deaths will, will make better shoe polish for the army? And what he did is he used a little bit of humor and satire to kind of point out how absurd some of this was. And he did that, the author, and then on this, in the same breath, he would also do these most lyrical, beautiful moments. Um, I'll tell you one, one more, and, we, and I'll make sure I stay longer so we can answer a few more questions of Victoria. But um, he tells the story of these whales, uh, this pod of whales, and how uh, a composer, an old man uh, named Marco, had written a symphony for the whales. And he was convinced that the only way to communicate with these creatures with some of the biggest minds on earth, biggest brains on earth would be through music because they sing, they sing at night. And he's, he's convinced that music is what humans must show these whales to show them that we're not altogether barbaric, that, that there's something beautiful to us. And so in the story, he gets a boat and he has his, he has a symphony out there and they position the speakers off the side and the BBC is there filming and so forth to capture this historic moment. And he, gathers the musicians and he taps his baton and they begin to play homage to the deep. And as they play this beautiful music across the water over the moonlight, see, this is the power of a story over a documentary per se, over statistics. <laughs> so this is the power of it. So as he, as he plays this music, this pod of whales comes closer and closer to the ship because they hear it. And as they stand, as they float there listening, the symphony ends, it's a great success. And that night, everybody goes to sleep. And while they're sleeping, they begin to hear music coming through from the depths of the sea. And the conductor's awakened, and he's brought, to, he's brought up to the deck. And he's listening, and the whales are playing back the symphony note for note. His chills thinking about it. And he's astounded by it. And he realizes they have the mind for it. They're better musicians than we could ever be. They've been singing for millions of years. And in that moment, the whaling vessel appears on the horizon. So see, notice how the author quickly takes you across this chasm, across this abyss suddenly. And they're in whaling waters. And they're asking them to move because the this ship has uh, has the harpoons, it has bone saws, it has, it's all built. It's a, it's a floating factory. And here's this perfect pot of whales. And so now everybody on the boat is waving and trying to get the, the whales to swim away. But the whales won't leave because they trust this boat. They've come to trust these humans now in this moment. And so here's the tension. And the conductor realizes, I have to communicate with them through music. And he tells his musicians to pull out a different piece of music he's written called Distress in Flight. And he raises that baton. And when he brings it down, the violins are shrieking and the cellos are screaming. And in that moment, all the blowholes open and they all take deep breaths and they all dive as the harpoon comes out and they all swim to safety. Now, in a moment like that in a movie, we might do more for helping whaling than everything Sea Shepherd's ever done. And Paul Watson's a friend of mine. I say that with respect. We might find a way through this wonderful medium to reach more hearts and, and minds. If we can find the means to make such films and if we can find the means to distribute such films wide, far and wide, maybe it'll have a positive effect. Mm. And I'm just thinking, what a lucky little girl you have to have such a storyteller for a dad. <laughs> so um, thank you for sharing with us this uh, project that's been on your mind for a long time. And you shared it first with us. And maybe you'll be sharing almost first with us a couple of things that are happening right now. What's coming up for you? I'm, I'm just starting a documentary right now with Dr. Greger, Michael Greger. For those of you who know him, he wrote How Not to Die and How Not to Diet. He's quite funny and charismatic, and he has nutritionfacts.org. And we're doing a, a film about how not to die. 
uh, we just start shooting this month, end of this month. So that'll be funny because because uh, Gregor's great. You know, for those of you who know him or listen to him, he's very factual. Everything is footnoted to the T, and there's it's all backed <laughs> up. But he's also kind of he's funny the way he does it, and so I'm hopeful that um, that uh, that will have a positive effect. So I'm doing that one. Um, that one's starting now. We're just starting that one. And I have this other one that I'm doing too, that uh, before the end of the year, that is a narrative. It's a smaller budget narrative. I also haven't talked much about it yet, but um, I won't tell you the title yet, but, um, but I'll give you guys basically the pitch so you can hear what the idea is. And the idea is this, an alien comes to earth. She, she looks human. She appears totally human. And she warns humanity that you have one year to stop destroying this planet or they're going to come back and uh, remove you. They're going to come back and remove you. And the reason is, is that um, earth and planets like earth are like an oasis in space. And there's great distances between these oases. And even our earth wasn't always a viable planet for a very long time. It was not hospitable to human. And so these uh, sort of cosmic allies, if you will, simply can't afford to have a native intelligent species destroy an oasis, destroy an oasis. And so, um, so the idea is to create a bit of a thriller and a drama. And, um, and of course, no one believes her. No one believes her. They think she's just this crazy woman. And I've named her Cassandra. Uh, Cassandra based on the Cassandra myth, for those of you who know the Cassandra myth where she was given the act of prophecy, but she was cursed that no one would believe her. So she foretold the fall of Troy, and she was the daughter of King Priam, but um, no one believed her, and of course, Troy fell. So the idea is to create a little bit of a film that's got a sci-fi feel, so it doesn't scream documentary. It uh, has an alien, and it has a woman, and she comes, and no one listens. And maybe through Act 1 and Act 2, uh, the audience will go along with us, but in Act 3, it hits you just like a documentary. So that's something else that I'm working on uh, later this year that uh, we hope will have a positive effect. I love it. Absolutely love it. Okay, let's get to some of these questions. It's 9.03. Can we let's go till 9.10? Yeah. Okay, sure, is that sure. Okay? I'll Bill? answer fast. I won't give okay. long answers, I promise. All right. So, so Rita is saying maybe an approach would be to look at why people feel they need meat. I've heard so many times people say they tried being vegan and they just don't feel good. They believe they need heavier protein, and they often refer to native peoples who traditionally ate meat. Well, the reason they do is because that is a tribute to the effectiveness of the marketing of the meat and dairy industry. We have to say they've done a heck of a job because most people think if I don't have it, I'm in trouble. I mean, in America, you know, we it's kind of the numbers are opposite, right? We are... There's no problem with protein. Uh, uh, we have a problem with fiber. You know, the numbers are completely the opposite. You probably know this as well as anybody, Victoria, that um, we're way lacking in our fiber. You know, we're like 97% down on fiber and we have more than enough protein. But somehow they effectively convince everybody that they need more protein. So we have to do a lot of un, um, a de you know, uneducating and sort of changing it. I don't know what the terminology is, you know, just to strip it away. Um, it's an excellent question. It's an excellent question. Um, I'm sure you've all have been asked millions of times, why do you get protein? You know, and again, a tribute to the effectiveness of the marketing of the meat and dairy mm -hmm. industry. <laughs> they don't let up. We'll follow that excellent question with an excellent quotation from Dr. Silas Rao, mm -hmm. who says, vegan means a system change. Plant-based means a product change. Ah, perfect. Uh, Can very say that good. Myself. Yeah. Uh, let's see, I'm looking for somebody who hasn't asked a question yet. Let's see. Okay, there are so many, I don't mean to leave you hanging. Let's see. Uh, animals are the guardians of being, says Eckhart Tolle. Actually, if we can get this chat printed and provide it for people, there's a lot of good stuff in here that's coming only to me, and I don't want to be um, the only one. Let's see. Wow, somebody says, I know a functional medicine practitioner who was vegan for 30 years and now eats high-quality meats. 
you know, we run into people like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, and uh, John wants to know the author of, of the book that uh, you're going to oh, base the film yeah, the on. Book, uh, the book is by an author named William Kotzwinkel. It's called Dr. Rat. And um, it, uh, it was written in the early 70s. And it predominantly takes place in a lab, in a lab. Uh, when you read it, you'll, you'll clearly have a sense of sort of the Vietnam Watergate sort of era. It has that feel to it. I adapted it to a, a more modern setting, but um, it was the author who had the dreams about animals saying, tell our story. So mm -hmm. a good chunk of it is, is uh, based on animal testing as opposed to animals in the wild, but peppered throughout of these beautiful lyrical stories of animals trying to communicate uh, and hoping for a connection with humans, which sort of never comes, unfortunately. Uh, and Phil is asking, as a school teacher, I believe the children are the future. What can they do? They can't vote or really protest. What can they do? Right. Well, hopefully they're just them being children uh, already has their compass pointing in the right direction. Uh, um, initially, they just have a sense of, um, hopefully, a bit of a sense of what seems good and what seems not so great not so great of course we indoctrinate our children just as we were all indoctrinated so it's uh they're kind of a blank slate these are such good questions i i wish i had the answer to all of them um i don't i hate to disappoint but i don't well let's finish up with one that probably nobody has an answer to but i'll try it on you so we know that you're comfortable behind a camera how about a crystal ball? So we've talked about the 17 years since Earthlings. What about 17 years projected into the future? Tell us either what you see or what you want to see. And that's your pick. I suppose it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's a bit of both. We, will, we, will, uh, we may be progressive and there may be some retroactive uh, stuff happening simultaneously, like the, like the Hummer and the Prius. We may see a bit of both uh, with that range of humanity. Um, the, the growth of the food movement, uh, the plant-based food movement is extremely encouraging. I remember the first time at Starbucks when they introduced soy and everything else up on that menu was whole milk, 2%, skim milk. You know, I mean, there's a whole slew of them. And now, as you all know, it's gone the other way, where it's just so much good. Uh, that is a marker. Yeah, that is a marker as an indicator. Um, so I'm very encouraged it'll go that way. And the plant and, and the meat companies that are making plant-based alternatives, that's also very encouraging. Um, the growth of the vegan food movement all over the world is also encouraging. Um, um, and if you really want to read something super encouraging, um, take a look at a website called Rethink X. Rethink X, if you're not familiar with it, I should really, you should really look at it. Particularly the port, report you want to look at is the Rethink X. Um, I think it's called the Food and Agriculture Report, which was written just before COVID. Yeah. It's a big report, about 75 pages, 76 pages. But it is one of the most encouraging things I've seen because it looks at this food revolution in terms of an innovation, the same way, um, the same way the smartphone, the smartphone which came out in two thousand seven, the smartphone and the cloud created the innovation of Uber and Airbnb. Uber and Airbnb could not have started before the advent of the smartphone and the cloud. So it was a convergence. And if you look at various disruptions throughout history, we are on the cusp right now of a food disruption and it should happen in the next 12 to 15 years where it will become economically unfeasible to, uh, there it is, someone just put it in there. Uh, it's an excellent report. Just read the first 10 pages and you will have a, a jolt of encouragement uh, that, we, that we are headed in the right direction that way, that they may go as far as being bankrupt, uh, the meat and dairy industry. They won't survive it economically economically they won't survive it yeah just like kodak by the way kodak as you all may know kodak went bankrupt a few years ago they're still around they're still kicking they're still surviving but kodak here's what no people don't realize kodak invented digital imagery think about that for a minute kodak invented the digital image which means some groovy geeky text downstairs were going <clears throat> excuse me uh we have something really cool here and the powers that be were saying we had 12 billion in sales this year. What are you talking about? 10 years later, stranded. It was over. So, uh, and the same thing happened with the iPhone N and the Android in 2007. You know, Nokia was the number one selling phone in 2007. We all probably had one, cool flip phones, right? 
a hundred million customers, cover of Forbes magazine. Who can stop the cell phone king, Nokia? And that year, a little item called the iPhone came out and the Android. And what did they say? They talked to Bloomberg. They talked to Motorola. They said, should we be nervous? And what did they tell them? They dismissed it the same as Kodak. They said, the iPhone, it's for geeks. Don't worry. <laughs> and one year later, Nokia pretty much stopped their whole uh, cellular service because it came in. A disruption like that in the food movement, which we're beginning to see right now, we're on the cusp of, is extremely encouraging. So I want to give everybody that little jolt of uh, positivity. That's a wonderful jolt of positivity. Uh, yeah. yeah, Debbie says, it's like the guy who didn't sign the Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. We, 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 we've all signed them. So, Sean, thank you. Uh, just blessings on your work coming up. And I'm just so excited. I didn't know I was going to uh, finish this feeling so positive. That's okay. a very powerful thing. Thank you so very much. And back to Reverend William to close. Okay, so I'm going to close. So I just want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. And I want to especially thank Sean and Victoria for this evening, which I just found amazing. And I hope you can join us for future services and events. So I'm going to close with what is definitely my favorite blessing regarding our treatment of animals. So it's very possible that I have closed services and events previously with the same prayer, but it is my favorite prayer. And I'm 70 years old. And so the best thing about being 70 years old is that you must forgive me for not remembering what I have said or done before. So this blessing is called A Prayer for Animals by Albert Schweitzer. And I think you've all heard of him. So here it goes. Hear our humble prayer, O God, for our friends, the animals, especially for animals who are suffering, for any that are hunted or lost or deserted or frightened or hungry, for all that will be put to death. We entreat for them all the mercy and pity. And for those who deal with them, we ask a heart of compassion and gentle hands and kindly words. Make us ourselves to be true friends to animals and so to share the blessings of the merciful. So thank you for joining us and so it is. That's it. However, if anybody wants to stay, I know Sean has films to make and things to do. But if anybody is feeling like you just really want to speak, uh, I'm willing to stay on and, and talk with anybody who uh, wants to have a little bit more of this evening. Is that going to work, um, Phil? Totally is. And if they okay. even want to show themselves, they could turn their little videos on. Okay, cool. There you go. Watch Dominion. Say something. Hey, good evening. Uh, thank you so much. A great session. Really inspired by hearing Sean again. My question is uh, social media uh, strategies. What are some of the ways that we can get the message out uh, to the masses? Thank you. I guess what I do with that is, is try to be Jane Velez Mitchell when I grow up. I think she's just such an incredible example of what can be done with social media. Who else would like to address that? Okay. Oi. Okay, so unmuted. So it's regarding the people who were vegan and now they're no longer vegan. Some of them were actually vegan. You know, they weren't just plant-based. It differs from person to person, but a lot of times it seems like the health issues are the most common one that makes people go back to something they knew where they didn't have some health issues. And I was wondering if maybe it would be a good idea to have a to have a more proper collection of data as to what kind of health issues people face on vegan diets, making them switch back to meat foods. Well, I'll address that and look for hands for other people who want to speak. I've been vegan for 38 years and have really observed this movement even before that, because for several years I was vegetarian struggling to be vegan. And, <coughs> excuse me, Whenever people say, 
I just didn't feel good. I went back because it just didn't feel good. It, they never say I developed a, a type two diabetes. You know, I, I, I gained a hundred pounds. I, you know, it's never anything that would send a person to a doctor. It's always some kind of little subtle, oh, I was tired. And very often, if you go a little bit more deeply into it with them, it was something else. They just got sick of being different or, or they got a new relationship and this person just couldn't handle their, their being vegan. So what's your experience? There are a lot of people here. I'm sure there's a lot of experiences. Rita, I have a hand up. No, Rita, say something. Yeah, hi. Um, well, I was the one talking about the functional medicine practitioner. And he also said that he didn't feel good, but he was also going on his blood test results and he wasn't getting, getting good blood test results. So that's, you know, he was going more on the chemistries of the body. So it was more like that. But I, I do understand that, you know, they just, it's like a low grade tiredness or something. It's not anything that's going to put them over the edge. Do Dr. Clapper has, has talked about this. And, and he has a very controversial response to it. He says that it's very rare when somebody truly cannot function without any animal products. But he believes that there are rare cases where this is so, and that those people with what he calls homeopathic doses of animal protein, like little tiny bit, seem to do better. You know, I don't know, you know, it's, it, to me as an ethical vegan, that's heretical, but I'm not a physician and I haven't run into these people. And, and he has, uh, Jim. Yeah. Thank you for, um, tonight. It was wonderful. Yeah. I remember actually seeing earthlings when it came out many years ago and it's very impactful. So it was wonderful hearing him speak tonight. Um, just the question that was, you know, how can we reach people um, thinking more like the Top Gun way, right? So as opposed to documentaries, um, you know, something like Babe, I think that really reached a lot of people. So I think more, you know, telling stories, the narrative, the fiction, but from the animals that are being eaten perspective, right? I, I think seeing more of those would really um, be a nice way to deliver the message. So what, was the name of, what was the name of that one again? It's Babe. It's the, the pig. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Cromwell. Um, so yeah, well, so you. yeah. So I think seeing more movies like that would be a nice way to deliver the message. Actually, I remember a film that I w found very, very uh, important. It was a uh, Okcha. It was a Korean mm -hmm. film with Tilda Swinton and Jake Gl Gyllenhaal. But it's about uh, this gigantic pig and gigantic super pigs, and uh, and a lot of them were were kind of freedom fighters for animals in it. And I think it was a great film and I highly recommend it. If you haven't seen it, definitely see it. Mm. Oh, it, for the, in the chat, uh, someone is saying, I doubt there's any scientific evidence regarding the efficacy of homeopathic treatment. He didn't mean homeopathic treatment. He meant, because the homeopathic idea is there's so little of it there that there's almost nothing there. And he was saying animal products in like this, you know, teeny, 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 tiny amounts. So this is uh, Dr. Michael Clapper. Uh, Sally. First, yeah, thanks. Th thank you, um, everyone. This has been an incredible presentation. Thank you, Sean. Um, there are two things that have come to my mind that, that I just think about mulling over about like how to reach, um, you know, more people as Sean was mentioning. One thing is that we all remember this commercial that came, became so big in the, I think it was the late eighties. It was um, Sarah McLaughlin with her song in the arms of an angel da, da, as she's holding dogs that are in shelters. And I think before that, there may not have been awareness about how many dogs in, you know, needed to be homed. And I think that probably did a lot that late night commercial. So that idea coupled with, um, you know, there are people who believe that one of the things that really prevents people from going vegan is that uh, we have baked into us such a need for social approval that if we think that we might be the only ones doing something, we will try to reject that first. So I'm thinking like we, you know, we are the world, right? We didn't maybe really know, not everyone knew exactly what that song was about until that song came about and the power of having all these um 
these looked up to and respected musicians talking about an issue, suddenly you want to be with the cool kids. So I don't know. These are just a couple of things that I rolling around. How can we make it look like everyone's doing it? The important people are doing it. Make it cool. Make it so, you know, I, I, I don't know how to this, but yeah, that was my thought. Thank you so much, Sally. Um, and there's a lot going on in the chat too, uh, if people want to look over there. William. Okay, so am I unmuted? Yes. Okay, so, you know, this question about reaching out, it's so, for me, it's just so difficult because I was a carnivore until I was, I don't know, Victoria, 46 or 47. And then the reason I went to the seminary and quit being a lawyer was because I just didn't understand how all these major religions would talk about compassion, compassion, compassion. And then every time they would eat a meal, they would torture and slaughter another living being. So it's just been a huge problem for me. But what I truly believe is that when you beat people over the head, with an idea, you only give them a headache. And nothing good has ever happened from trying to make other people feel bad about themselves. So it is such a long road and it's so frustrating, but I believe that we just have to keep reaching out. Like when I have a meal with somebody who's eating meat, I don't chastise them for eating meat, but if they ask me why I'm not, I will explain it to him, and oh, it's such a long road. But to me, that's the only thing you can do because you just, like I said, you cannot beat people over the head. You cannot make them feel bad about themselves. They become defensive, and you've you've lost. That's it. Thank you, uh, Nancy, and then Oli. Hi, everyone. What an incredible evening. Just quickly, I have a vegan food business and it's totally changed how I do vegan advocacy. And someone mentioned earlier about the alluding to the, the normalcy and having it a social experience. And that that has a huge amount re, impact about why people don't go vegan or why people were and then they went and they stopped. And so the more we help normalize vegan food. And for me, that's a, a big central part of my advocacy. I know all of it, all of it, you know, every way that animals and people are being abused needs to stop. But food is such a core central issue. And, and I think that every vegan needs to do something to uh, help get vegan food out there more and normalize it and, and just support with any, any, in any way possible. It's more effective than protesting and it's more effective possibly than even showing the horrors. Although it's important people know those exist. So that's my two cents, thank you. Well, thank you, Nancy. Uh, Aoi. So with reference to what the William mentioned, I, I wish it was the case that only friendly, compassionate outreach worked. But the sad truth is other techniques also work in some ways. The only thing I don't know is if the other techniques are harming potential converts in the long run or not. And so I always prefer to shy on the side of you know, being compassionate and nice to people. But I do agree that there is a potential benefit in the other techniques, especially if you're after short-term benefits. It can sometimes help you win short-term benefits faster. And I personally think a lot of this anger and frustration comes from what I see as a flawed understanding that's prevalent in society about objective morality. And I think until we as a community address that and actually hash it out, and then I expect that, you know, about 90 plus percent of us are going to decide that that's right, there is no objective morality, then we will change how we communicate to people. We can still be passionate, but maybe we will just stop having this us versus them, your wrong attitude. Okay. Thank you. I think it's so much like smoking. You know, I mean, when I was young, smoking was cool. All the actors did it in every movie. 
And now I see people in New York City in the wintertime, and they're out in front of their office building smoking, huddled against the bricks. And I feel sorry for them. So it's just been this huge shift. And if we could do that with animal foods, we'd be um, a lot further down the road to our goal. Rita. I really like the Sarah McLaughlin example because everyone has a rescue dog now. I mean, it's gotten huge. So that little song just made ripples, didn't it? I'm not sure. The Labradoodle is quite popular. I work. With, <laughs> I happen to work at a animal shelter, and uh, it's staggering the amount of purebreds that are still being born. Uh, uh, Chris, I think you had a hand up earlier. Did you still have something to share? Hi. Yeah. There was a bunch of movies I could think of that had to do with animal rights, or that partially had to do with these. You know, stuff like uh, I haven't seen all of these, but I remember seeing Bambi, and I didn't. I read the play, I read parts of the plague dogs and remember Charlotte's Web and uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. There's a character in there that was experiment, that experimented on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'll be bringing his and, story more forward in the next film too. Rocket, yes. Yep. And Dumbo, the original Dumbo. I don't yeah. know about the, I don't know about the second one, but I know the original one was very much, yeah, was very much don't torture elephants or something like that. I don't yeah. remember all of them. And I just would like to do a shout out for a, a feature film that's coming in November. It's called Bones and All, starring uh, Taylor Russell and Timothy Chalamet. And it's based on a young adult novel of the same name by Camille DeAngelis, who's a vegan. She's a, a graduate of Main Street Vegan Academy. And the main character is a teenage cannibal. Now, she doesn't cannibalize people every day, but every now and then she just feels like she needs to eat human flesh. So this is written, you know, it's kind of a coming of age horror story, but written from a vegan perspective, because this is the same thing we hear from people, you know, well, I don't eat much meat. So uh, bones and all <laughs> coming this fall. Oh, um, actually, I'd like to plug one other thing. I remember the books that he was talking about uh, before with uh, Dr. Rat uh, by William Kotzwinkel. And it's funny that they, that they were talking about William Kotzwinkel because I was like, I recognize that name. I recognize that name. When I was a kid, William Kotzwinkel did the book version of E.T. the Extraterrestrial, which also had a scene about him um, setting the frogs mm -hmm. free, you know, from getting experimented on and getting killed in class. Wow. So wow. Hmm, maybe maybe he really empathized with that. And also anybody could think of the, you know, you could take, you know, this caring about this 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 alien as opposed to animals. You know, you could you could you could make the connection there because we are all literally animals. Mm. Uh, another one, I guess this is technically a documentary, but oh my gosh, it seemed like a, a feature film was My Octopus Teacher. Mm. The relationship between this filmmaker and this octopus, it was breathtaking. Mm -hmm. So this is film night. We get to talk about films. Yeah, okay, can everybody. About films. <laughs> it is a bit past 9.30, so uh, at least here on the East Coast, half past the hour, wherever you are. So are there any burning desires? Does anybody really need to share something? If so, we'll hear that person or those people, and then uh, we'll go on to dinner or sleep. Paige. Just real quickly, I don't know if everyone knows. Hi. Um, I don't know if Sean mentioned it, but you can watch Earthlings on Unchained TV. So your streaming network, um, free. If, FYI, so. Just wanted Perfect. people to know there's lots of documentaries in there um, on Chain TV. Great to see you all. Great to see you, Paige. Anybody else? Uh, okay. Well, then I think it is a uh, good night. I hope that we'll see you for the Compassion Consortium service uh, featuring light from Gentle World the fourth Sunday of this month, and then the fourth uh, Sunday of September with Ivana Lynch. That's gonna be so much fun. And otherwise, let's just stay connected because together I'll bet we can do this. All the best, everybody. God bless. <laughs>